Hello there future ACCs, I'm a proud Fintrama Vishnu Vijay and I welcome you all to Fintram's Revision Bootcamp for the Performance Management Paper. So what is the bootcamp all about? Let me explain that. There are two pillars that we are covering here. And the first pillar is regarding the key topics from the PM syllabus. Because we will be revising through all the important topics from the PM syllabus. And secondly, we'll be focusing on the video question marathon where we will be practicing a lot of questions so that you can develop the skill of application. Well, why are we doing that? Because you already know all the knowledge related aspects, isn't it? Now what you have to do is you have to develop the skill of applying that knowledge into certain questions. So that is why in the question marathon, we'll be practicing a pool of questions so that you can develop that particular skill. But before that, we have to have a strong base in our knowledge, isn't it? That is why we are about to revise through all the key topics from the PM syllabus so that you can refresh your memory and make that particular knowledge concrete in your mind. So I know that you're all really excited to begin. So let's not, let's not waste any time and take a look at the first aspect that is the revision of the PM key topics, shall we? Now we will be focusing on each syllabus areas, okay guys? So there are five syllabus areas in the PM syllabus, isn't it? And the first syllabus area would be part A, that is information, technologies and systems for organizational performance. So what all systems do we need in our organization for this particular uh, performance, or in measure performance, etc. That's basically what we are taking a look at. So mainly we've talked about information systems here, isn't it? So what exactly is the information system? Let's take a look. Information systems comprises of a set of components, namely hardware and software, telecommunication networks, etc. So it is a set of components, isn't it? So what kind of set of components? Basically hardwares and software, okay guys, that is used to communicate and operate or conduct the business operations a bit more in an efficient and effective manner, okay guys, so keep that in mind. And of course, why do we have this? Well, every organization has some data requirements. So in order to meet that data requirements, we have information systems so that work together to deal with the data requirements of the business. And such requirements include the communication, record keeping, decision making, data analysis, etc. Okay, so for all these functions, we use the information system. So keep that in mind. Next, what exactly is the difference between the internet and intranet? Well, the internet is a public network, isn't it? Whereas the intranet is a private network used by organizations so that they can safely uh, keep their resources, confidential information, etc. within that network itself, guys. So that's basically the idea there. And yeah, let's take, take a look at that. An interconnection of various networks that can be public, private, or at the organization level. Okay, so it can be public, private, or at the organization level, and it can also link global devices together using various technologies to create an internet network known as the internet, as simple as that. So it is an interconnection of various networks and global devices, so keep that in mind. And what about an intranet? A network of devices which is private and not available to the public. In an intranet, the networked Computers or devices are available only to a group of authorized users. So only a authorized group of people can have access to the intranet, isn't it? So keep that in mind. That's basically the main difference here. There are also other differences, so keep that in mind. And what else? We look at the wireless technology, which is something that we commonly use, isn't it? We have a lot of wireless devices as well as we use the Wi-Fi on a daily basis. There is that as well, isn't it? So that's basically what is being stated here. Wireless technology is a communication technology that does not depend upon communication mediums like cables or wires. So keep that in mind. And what else? Then we have, then we look at internal information. So what exactly is internal information? Information that is available within the organization. Okay guys, so keep that in mind. These information that is used within the organization for management decision making purposes. So why do we use it for? In order to take good decisions as well as for other managerial purposes and internal information can be confidential as well isn't it so keep that in mind and commercially sensitive which means that we cannot just you know casually talk it to uh, you know release that particular information to the public that's basically it 
and internal information is usually provided via a management report. So what is a management report all about? Let's take a look. Management reports should contain quality information and should be communicated via the right channels. The qualities of good quality information can be memorized as a mnemonic that is accurate, isn't it? So remember accurate. So what are management reports? These are basically information that contain quality internal information. And what is a good quality information? Well, you can use the mnemonic accurate in order to remember, remember that, isn't it? A stands for accurate, C stands for complete, C stands for cost or benefit because we have to make sure that the benefit exceeds cost before trying to generate an information. That's basically the aspect here. U stands for understandable, R stands for relevant, A stands for accessible, we are the right channel, T stands for timely, you have to get the right information at the right time to make a uh, up, uh, on time decision, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. And E stands for ease of use. So these are the characteristics of a good quality information. And then we look at security of highly confidential information. So how can we, you know, secure highly confidential information? What do you think? The organization must ensure that highly high confidential or commercially sensitive information should not be divulged to unauthorized third parties. The following factors can help ensure safety. Okay, so what all safety measures can we take here? We can set up passwords for our systems or laptops. And what else? Uh, we can provide or implement certain physical or logical access control into certain, you know, uh, confidential rooms that have confidential data, for example, a server room, etc. And then we, there are database security controls such as the firewalls and encryption. And then there are antivirus and anti spyware softwares. And of course, there are privacy policies in order to protect confidential information as well, isn't it? So, due to all these factors, you, or using all these factors, we will be able to secure highly confidential data from, uh, you know, uh, from unauthorized users. That's basically the idea here. And keep that in mind. And then we have data and information. So what is the difference between data and information? Data is basically raw facts and figures, isn't it? And information is the processed form of data that can be more meaningful, isn't it? So a meaningful form of data is known as information. So that is the different key difference between these two aspects. Let's take a look. Data is raw facts and figures and they are yet to be processed into a form that can be that can enable decision making. Information is meaningful data that can be uh, that has been summarized and manipulated and can therefore enable decision making. So that is basically what information is all about. And then we have a data processing system. A data processing system is a system that records, analyzes, sorts, summarizes, calculates and stores the day to day transaction taking place within an organization. So that is what a data processing system is all about, isn't it? So it contacts all these functions on data collected from day-to-day -day transactions etc okay guys so keep that in mind and then we have certain data capture and processing cost as well isn't it because it does involve a lot of cost in order to collect data analyze it sort it restore store it etc okay guys so keep that in mind so what all costs are we talking about here the cost of collecting processing and producing internal information is divided by an organization in three types there are direct data capture cost processing data as well as indirect costs relating to this as well okay guys so that's basically what we've done there and then we move on to management accounting information so what is this all about well the information that is used to support strategic planning control and decision making process is known as management accounting information so what is strategic planning control and decision making the word strategic here means a focus on the long term okay guys so the top level of a particular management, what, what do they do? They focus on the long-term objective of the organization, isn't it? They focus on the long-term objective and how to get there by implementing various strategies. So in order to assist with that particular function, we have management accounting information that can help provide certain long-term forecasts and other related information so that the manager can take the take an appropriate decision. Okay, so that's basically, basically why we use management accounting information. So, so it relates to Strategic planning, control, and decision making. And strategic means long term focused. Okay, guys, so keep that in mind. And then we look at levels of management. So, how many levels are there? There are three levels, isn't it? There is the top level, middle level, and operational level, isn't it? 
or lower level. Let's call it lower level here. And another cool term for these levels would be for top level, we can also call it strategic level, isn't it? So keep that in mind. And for middle level, we call it the tactical level. And the lower level is basically the operational level. So keep that in mind. And in the top level or strategic level, we have the top tier management, isn't it? That is basically our board of directors, the CEO, CFO, etc. And they will be focusing on the long term decisions of the company or the strategic planning, control, and decision making. So keep that in mind. And how do they do that? Using management accounting information. So keep that in mind. And then we have the tactical level who focuses on medium or short term plans or targets. And they're the ones who act as a link between the particular strategic level as well as the operational level. So keep that in mind. And finally, we have the operational level who, who is basically the employees, foremen and other related managers. And the tactical level, we have the line managers such as the production manager, sales manager, etc. So keep that in mind as well. And the operational level, they focus on the day to day activities and their focus is basically on a short term, you guys, short term time frame. So keep that in mind. So that's basically about all the levels of management. And this basic, uh, there's another name for this particular topic that is the Antony's hierarchy, you guys. So keep that in mind. And then we have strategic management accounting. So the, what does this focus on? Let's take a look. Strategic management accounting focuses on external factors non-financial as well as internally generated information. So we are focusing on three things mainly, you guys. First of all, we'll be fo focusing on internal and external factors, and we will also be focusing on financial as well as non-financial factors as well, you guys. So that is basically what strategic management accounting information relates to. So keep that in mind. And of course, it's basically for a long-term uh, focus. So keep that in mind as well. Now, what all types of information systems do we have? We have the transaction processing system that stores, collects, analyzes data, isn't it? So that's basically what this system is all about. And then we have the management information system, which assists in decision making by incorporating all the internally generated information. Okay, guys, this is basically how this system assists a manager. So keep that in mind. And then we have the decision support system as well, isn't it? So what does it do? Well, this system helps us to manipulate and model data, isn't it? There is that. And we also have the executive information system as well or EIS. And what does it do? Executive information system takes into account both internal as well as the external information and then assist with the decision making uh, for the management. Okay, guys. So that's basically what the executive information system is all about. And then we have ERPS, which is in, uh, Enterprise Resource Planning System, which is an integrated system that covers all the functions within the that integrates all the functions within the organization into a single system. So that's basically what it is. And always take a look at the advantages and features of the system. Okay, guys, those are really important. And then we have customer relationship management systems as well, isn't it? And using this particular system, we will manage the customer relationship so that we can retain our customer and ensure our customer's loyalty. Okay, guys, so that's basically why we use the system for. And then we move on to one of the next big topics that's basically big data. Okay, guys, so what is big data all about? Well, it's basically a huge volume of data to put it very simply, isn't it? So keep that in mind. So big data is the collection and analysis of a large amount of data to find trends, understand customer needs, and help organization to focus resources more effectively. Okay. And of course, performance management. Uh, well, yeah, before taking a look at that. So what is big data? It is basically a huge volume of data. And speaking about big data, there are three characteristics of big data that you should understand here. What are the three characteristics? We call it the three V's. So what are the three V's? We have volume, velocity, and <clears throat> veracity well that's the fourth we however the third we would be variety you okay, guys variety and there is also a fourth we called veracity which is involving the accuracy of the particular uh, data however let's just focus on the three v's for now okay guys so volume relates to the particular quantity of data available okay guys we have a huge volume of data available isn't it you know to analyze certain patterns as well as trends so that is basically what this is all about and then we have 
velocity which involves the speed at which we can receive that particular data and of course we can receive data at a split second isn't it so keep that in mind and then we have variety we have a wide variety of data that can be used for various purposes as well so these three are the characteristics known as the three v's of big data so keep that in mind and then we look at the term called performance management what exactly is that performance management is the process of managing the organization in order to ensure that it meets its objectives okay so we are meeting our objectives by managing performance within an organization that is what performance management is all about and then we look at the big data and its relevance big data is relevant to performance management in the following ways by gaining insights forecasting better automation of high level business processes and provides more detailed and up to date performance measurement so by the following reasons we will be able to use big data for performance management related purposes isn't it so that's basically what is being covered here so that's all for what we've covered here isn't it now moving on to the next syllabus area that is part b specialist cost and management accounting techniques so what did we learn here we talked about costing isn't it what is costing costing is the process of determining the cost of products services or activities that's basically what we do using costing techniques and the first and foremost method that we learned was the absorption costing method isn't it so what is the absorption costing all about an absorption costing which is the traditional method of costing it is a form of costing in which the cost of products are calculated by adding an amount of indirect production cost or overheads to direct costs of production so why do we use this method we use this method so that we can apportion the indirect cost the cost that are not directly attributable to the product to each unit of our output okay guys that's basically why we use the absorption costing method because well when you take a look at the direct cost we can just directly attribute it to each and every product isn't it however when we take a look at indirect cost it may be a bit difficult so in order to allocate these indirect costs what should we do well first of all we have to take the total overhead cost or in other words total indirect cost and divide it with the budgeted level of activity isn't it so that's basically the equation so we can just absorb the particular uh indirect cost using something called an overhead absorption rate isn't it so what what is the overhead absorption rate or how do you calculate it the overhead absorption rate would be the budgeted total overheads divided by the budgeted activity level isn't it as simple as that okay guys this is how you calculate the overhead absorption rate now then we move on to the next one that is the activity based method so what is the activity based costing method all about in activity based costing which is a more modern way of allocating the indirect cost or the overheads what we focus on is we will not only focus on the production overheads but we also focus on the non production overheads as well okay guys we can allocate each and every overheads to each unit of output so the thing is what we do here is we focus on the cost drivers rather than taking a common basis for all overheads because when you calculated the uh, particular budgeted total overheads we took the budgeted activity level the same budgeted activity level for all total overheads isn't it and the budgeted activity activity level can either be number of units the uh, machine hours or labor hours taken etc isn't it however when we move on to abc costing what are we doing here for each and every overheads we will have certain cost drivers so the particular factor that causes that particular overhead to incur so we will be looking at that particular cost driver and then allocating then calculating the absorption rate and then absorb to each unit isn't it that's basically what we do in activity based costing isn't it so keep that in mind and do some questions relating to this topic so that you can get a better understanding of it so keep that in mind so what is it all about let's take a look activity based costing is the method of costing which involves identifying the cost of the main support activities and the factors that drive the cost of each activities isn't it so we take a look at the cost drivers and use the cost drivers in order to allocate the overhead to each unit now another factor is that when you compare the absorption costing as well as activity based costing you will be able to identify that the activity based costing 
will provide you with a more accurate figure, isn't it? So that's basically yet another factor to consider. However, you have to take a look at the advantages and disadvantages as well. There is a possibility that the cost of implementing an ABC may, can exceed its benefits, isn't it? Because ABC is a bit more expensive and time consuming than absorption costing. So keep that in mind. Identify all that uh, and learn all that advantages and limitations. Okay, guys, that's really important. And what else? Then we have the target costing as well, isn't it? So what do we have here? What is target costing all about? Target costing, it involves setting a target cost by subtracting desired profit from a competitive market price. Here we learn the step-by-step -step process, isn't it? The first step in target profit is to determine the expected sales volume, isn't it? And then what you have to do is you have to determine an determine a desired selling price and after that you have to set a profit margin and then when you deduct the expected profit margin with the expected sales value or sales price you will get the target cost isn't it and this particular target cost is compared with the estimated cost of production and if there is a difference we call it the cost gap that's basically how the target costing works isn't it fairly an easy process if you ask me so that's basically how we do it and then what we do is we take measures you know to cost sorry close the cost gap isn't it so that's basically how we do it so we have a few equations here that is first of all we're looking at the equation of target cost which is desired or expected selling price minus desired profit margin and then we have the cost gap the cost gap is basically the difference between the target cost and the estimated cost of production as simple as that okay, yes this is these are basically the equations that you should remember here and what else then we looked at value analysis, isn't it? So what is value analysis all about? It's basically value engineering. That's another term. So value analysis is also known as cost engineering and value engineering. It's a technique in which firms products and maybe those of its competitors are subject to critical and systematic examination by a small group of specialists. They can be representing various functions such as design, production and sales and finance as well. Okay, so that's basically what value analysis is all about as simple as that isn't it so we will be looking at each and every business processes as well as function and design etc and we'll eliminate out all the uh, let's say uh, non-value adding activities or non-value adding uh, resources or uh, components etc okay so that's basically the idea behind value analysis try to reduce cost by eliminating unnecessary activities or unnecessary uh, features of a particular product and then you know make it making it a bit more effective and efficient that's basically the idea here so what else then we move on to the next one that is target costing in service industries can we implement target costing as service industries it could be difficult isn't it why let's take a look it is difficult to use target costing in service industries because the because of the Characteristics and information requirements. There are five major characteristics of services that distinguish it from uh, manufacturing. What are these five characteristics? We have intangibility, isn't it? Services are intangible. And then we have its inseparability, the simultaneity, the heterogeneity, and there is no transfer of ownership as well, isn't it? So keep that in mind, okay, guys? So that's basically the features here. And due to these features, it can be difficult to implement target costing in service industries and then we move along to life cycle costing and what are we doing here we are taking a look at the entire life cycle of a particular product and then we calculate its total cost and revenues and then we take a look at as to whether this particular product is profitable or not isn't it so that's basically the idea here so the life cycle cost per unit is the total cost over the entire life cycle divided by the total number of units sold that's basically it okay guys so keep that remember that particular equation and what else we have life cycle costing tracks and accumulates the cost and revenues attributable to each product over its entire product life cycle and so that's basically what life cycle costing is all about so keep that in mind and then we have just in time as well okay guys it is a and what is this just in time exactly it's basically 
a environment is in a new form of modern business environment uh, which has the following features let's take a look at as to what it is it is a pull based system of production pulling work through the system in response to customer demand okay so what are we doing here we will produce our products when the particular demand comes in because okay, that is basically why we call it a pull based system when you receive an order you start manufacturing the product that's basically the uh, system behind just in time so keep that in mind so this means that goods are only produced when they are needed and eliminating large so uh, stock of materials and finished goods okay guys so we don't keep inventory however we may keep a certain buffer inventory in case of uh, certain uh, emergency situations however other than that uh, we won't we will keep our inventory to the minimum okay guys so keep that in mind and then we have Total quality management, which is yet again uh, another policy that is adopted by various businesses. And what does this mean? This means that you have to continuously improve in that particular business operations. Okay, guys, that's basically the idea here. So it is the continuous improvement in quality, productivity, and effectiveness through a management approach focusing on both the processes and the product. So in TQM, we have a zero defect policy. That is, we should get it right the first time. You guys, you should, that is how you can improve continuously. There should be zero wastages and we have to conduct our production in the most efficient way possible. And we have to continue improving after each and every production process. That's basically the idea behind total quality management. We don't really focus on the productivity, but mainly the quality as well as the effectiveness of the process as well. So keep that in mind. And then, why are we learning about this? Because we are looking at throughput accounting. And throughput accounting is a costing technique that is used in these environments. That is a just-in-time as well as a TQM environment. Let's take a look at that. It supports a management system which aims to maximize throughput before cash generated generation from sales, isn't it? So what is throughput accounting all about? Well, what is throughput exactly? Throughput is basically sales minus material cost isn't it not variable cost it is sales minus material cost and in throughput accounting we have a lot of assumptions isn't it for example every cost other than the material cost will be fixed isn't it so keep that in mind okay guys so uh, all the other costs that is a labor cost as well as other overheads etc all these are assumed to be fixed and we call them factory cost here so keep that in mind and then another factor that you should Remember here would be the fact that how to calculate the uh, particular production, optimum production plan. How do you calculate that? Well, in order to identify the optimum production plan, what you have to do is you have to first of all identify the bottleneck resource, isn't it? And what is the bottleneck resource? Basically a limiting factor or a binding constraint in this particular scenario, isn't it? So what exactly is that? Well, let's say that we have three machines, machine A, B, and C. If machine A can produce 10 units in an hour and machine B can produce 5 units in an hour and C can produce yet again 10 units in an hour, out of this which would be the bottleneck resource or the binding constraint? It is obviously machine B, isn't it? Why? Because no matter how much effective you become in machine A and C, you can only produce a final output of 5 units in 1 hour because B, uh, that is the minimum uh, or maximum capacity of machine B, isn't it? That's basically why it is a bottleneck resource. A bottleneck resource is something or a, a particular activity that constrains or limits the output, okay guys, final output. That's basically the idea behind machine B. So that's basically as to how the bottleneck resources work and in order to identify or you know to prioritize certain products for manufacturing what you can do is you can calculate the throughput per unit of bottleneck by calculating the throughput per unit of bottleneck you will be able to prioritize the product that you should provide the first priority second priority and third priority in a while creating an optimum production plan so keep that in mind and then we look at throughput accounting ratio. So what did we learn here? So it is the ratio of throughput per unit of bottleneck resource to the factory cost per unit of bottleneck resource, isn't it? And this ratio should be as high as possible and certainly it should be more than one. So keep that in mind. So what is the equation here? The equation would be throughput 
throughput per unit of bottleneck divided by the factory cost per unit of bottleneck so this is basically the equation for TA ratio or throughput accounting ratios in it so this is really important so keep that in mind okay guys so MCQs can be tested from this particular uh, aspect so keep that in mind now what else now we move on to the next costing technique that is environmental management accounting this particular costing technique focus on the environmental related aspects isn't it so keep that in mind so EMA is the generation and analysis of both financial and non-financial information in order to support internal environment management processes okay guys internal environmental management processes so what we are going to do is we're going to identify the environmental cost and account for it that's basically it okay guys so there are various techniques that you can use as part of environmental management accounting first of them is input or output analysis what are we doing here we are taking a look at as to what goes in and what comes out and uh, the idea here is that if 100% of input goes in then the 100% should come out isn't it so that is basically what we are focusing on here okay guys so it operates on the principle that what comes in must go out output is split across sold and stored goods and wastage as well okay guys? if there is wastage you have to account for that as well that is basically what this process is all about and measuring these categories in physical quantities and monetary terms forces a business to focus on environmental cost as well for example if we started accounting for wastages then we will certainly be able to minimize wastage isn't it? and minimize wastage could be beneficial for the environment as well okay so that's basically the idea behind input or output analysis then we look at flow cost accounting what do we do here it inputs and outputs are measured through each individual process of production a distinction is made between positive and negative products so in each technique okay guys in this technique what we do is we split the particular output into negative and positive products what are positive product this is the good output whereas the negative products are basically the measurement of waste that's basically it and of course in this technique material flows through an organization are divided into three categories so what are these three categories the cost of each category is measured separately we have materials category and then we have systems and delivery and disposal so we already know as to what material is isn't it so here what we do is we take a look at what all materials were actually used in the production and what percentage is the wastage okay guys so that's basically the positive and negative goods and what else in system we look at the in-house handling that is required including labor and its cost and as for delivery and disposal this is the cost of transportation and cost of disposal of waste etc okay guys so these are the aspects that we look at in flow cost accounting so keep that in mind and then we have environmental uh, activity based costing as well isn't it and what do we look at here it combines the element of environmental costing with an activity based costing system so we use the abc principle in environmental accounting that's basically it so what are we doing here we are looking at the cost drivers of environmental cost what exactly causes or incurs a particular environment co environmental cost that's basically the idea here so keep that in mind and then finally we have environmental life cycle costing as well isn't it so environmental cost of a product are considered from the design stage of product right up to the end of life, uh, life cost such as decommissioning as well as removal okay so that's basically what the environmental life cycle cost is all about so keep that in mind so we'll be looking at the entire life cycle of the particular product and assessing as to whether what all level of environmental cost will it incur over its life cycle that's basically it guys that's basically what we do here basically we use the uh, life cycle costing principles in environmental accounting that's basically it okay guys that's basically all about this particular costing technique and that concludes syllabus part b okay guys now we move on to the next syllabus area that is syllabus part c so folks here the first thing that we'll be focusing on is relevant cost analysis isn't it? and what are relevant costs these are future incremental cash flows isn't it so keep that in mind so relevant cost is a future incremental future cash flows arising as a direct consequence of a decision so 
if you make a decision then this particular impact or the cost that will be incurred as a direct consequence of that particular decision are known as relevant costs so keep that in mind and of course there are certain other costs known as sunk costs, committed costs as well as non-cash expenses like depreciation these are all known as irrelevant costs why because some of them have already occurred some of them will occur no matter the regardless of the decision so due to these factors these costs are considered to be irrelevant okay guys so keep that in mind that's basically what relevant cost analysis is all about and then we take a look at another factor that is basically the diagram okay guys the relevant factor sorry the relevant cost for materials and labors in that particular aspect we will learn about two diagrams so what are these diagrams let's take a look at that shall we so first of all let's take a look at the diagram that can be used to tackle question relating to identifying relevant cost of material so when you're required to identify the relevant cost of material the first thing that you should take a look at is as to whether the material is in stock or out of stock so that is, that is the first thing that you should consider is the material in stock or out of stock if it is out of stock then the relevant cost would be the current purchase price okay guys however if it is in stock then we have to consider two things is it in regular use or will it not be replaced okay guys So, if it is in regular use, then that will be re replaced in a frequent manner, isn't it? Therefore, the relevant cost would be current purchase price. However, if it is not replaced, then what you have to consider is the, is the fact as to whether it has an alternative use or not okay guys so the relevant cost will obviously be the opportunity cost what is this this is basically the cost of the uh, best alternative foregone isn't it so that's basically as to what an opportunity cost is all about now so the aspect to be considered here is as to whether the fact that there is any alternative use if no then the opportunity cost which is basically the relevant cost to be used here would be the scrap value if in case that there is an alternative use then the opportunity cost would be the higher of value in the other use for example let's say there could be any contribution etc that particular value or the scrap value so whichever is higher you will choose that isn't it that's basically the uh, opportunity cost here okay guys so this particular diagram can be used as a framework to calculate the relevant cost of material so what if we have to calculate the relevant cost of labor let's take a look at that shall we that is the next aspect that we are looking at relevant cost of labor so here the first aspect to consider is as to whether we have spare capacity or are we operating in full capacity if we have spare capacity then the relevant cost would be nil because well we have spare capacity that means that we have additional laborers to work uh, work with therefore we can just utilize that labors that's basically it there is no additional cost involved isn't it however if we are operating in let's say full capacity then another aspect that we have to consider is as to whether we should 
I'm just gonna put two alternatives here. So either we can hire more labor. Or can't hire more labor. So if we hire more labor, then what would happen? Then the relevant cost would be the cost of labor, isn't it? The extra cost of labor that you will be incurring in order to hire new people, isn't it? However, if we can't hire more labor, then the relevant cost would be opportunity cost of diverting labor that is let's say lost contribution isn't it so if you can't hire labor then that would mean that in a particular environment in which the laborers are working in full capacity we have to take up laborers from other production processes isn't it so if that happens then that particular process in which we are taking the particular laborers from will have certain lost contribution and this lost contribution is considered to be the opportunity cost here okay guys so this particular diagram can be used to uh, take a look at or calculate the relevant cost of labor so uh, keep that in mind it's really important now let's continue taking a look at the concepts here there we go now we take a look at introduction to CVP analysis. Okay guys, so what is CVP analysis? Basically it is the study of cost, volume as well as profits, isn't it? So keep that in mind. So CVP stands for cost, volume, profit analysis. CVP used to show how cost and profits change with the change in volume of activity. Okay guys, so you can also call it break even analysis, isn't it? So keep that in mind. And we've learned a lot of equations here, isn't it? First of all, we learned about the contribution. What is contribution? It's basically selling price minus variable cost, isn't it? So keep that in mind. And then we learned about the CS ratio as well. So what did we learn there? We looked at the contribution divided by sales times 100, isn't it? That's basically the ratio there. And then we have profit. So how is profit calculated? Profit is basically contribution minus fixed cost. There are also further other equations. Let's write this, write it down. How do you calculate the break-even units now to calculate the break-even units we have the following equation that is the fixed cost divided by contribution per unit isn't it as simple as that and how do you calculate the break-even revenue this could be calculated by calculating fixed cost divided by CS ratio, isn't it? So if you get, want to obtain the number of units to break even, then you divide it with contribution per unit. And if you want to obtain the uh, number of, or the monetary value of the break even point, then you have to divide it using the CS ratio. So remember that. And then we also uh, calculated the margin of safety as well, isn't it? So what exactly is the equation for that? Margin of safety is basically budgeted sales minus break-even sales divided by budgeted sales times 100, isn't it? That's basically how you calculate the margin of safety. And then what if you have to calculate the number of units to be sold to achieve a target profit? So if you have to identify the number of units to be sold to achieve a target profit, then the equation to apply here, it would be fixed cost plus target profit divided by contribution per unit as simple as that okay guys so that's basically how you calculate the number of units to be sold to achieve a target profit so keep that in mind and then we have the weighted average cs ratio as well isn't it so how do you calculate that that's basically the total contribution per unit divided by the number of units as simple as that okay guys so keep that in mind so that's basically all the equations that we've learned in CVP analysis, isn't it? So that's basically that. Moving on to the next factor, that is the limiting factors. So what did we learn here? So these are basically scarce resources, isn't it? So keep that in mind. So 
It is any factor that is in scarce supply and that stops the organization from expanding its activities further so that there is a maximum level of activity at which the organization can operate. So that is basically what a limiting factor is. These are basically binding constraints, isn't it? And due to these factors, we have to plan our production in a more effective manner. Okay, guys, so you will have to calculate something called the contribution per limiting factor, isn't it? So by calculating the contribution per limiting factor, you will be able to prioritize the products that should be manufactured. Okay, so that's basically why you use it. And that's basically what limiting factor is all about. Then we also learned another concept known as linear programming as well. So what did we learn there? What is linear programming? It is a problem solving tool. Okay, guys, so let's take a look. It is a technique for solving problems of profit maximization or cost minimization and resource allocation. And if a scenario has two or more limiting factors, then linear programming must be used to determine the contribution maximizing or cost minimizing solution. So we apply linear programming in a particular scenario where we have two products and more than one limiting factor. Okay, guys, so keep that in mind. Now, another factor to consider here is the fact that we learned in this particular topic, such as the feasible region, how to point out the feasible region, the simultaneous equation used to solve uh, or, you know, to identify the optimum solution, etc. Okay, guys, all these factors are really important because it can be tested in your exam. Uh, you won't be required to draw the particular graph. However, you may have to interpret the graph and identify the feasible region and certain equations, etc. Okay, guys, so keep that in mind. And then you learn about slack and surplus, isn't it? And what is slack and surplus all about? Slack occurs when maximum availability of a resource is not fully utilized. It, uh, it is the amount of unused resources or other constraint where the constraint is a less than or equal to constraint. Surplus occurs when, uh, yeah, first of all, let's take a look at slack. Slack is basically when we have availability of, let's say, 1000 kg of resources. However, we are only utilizing 800 kg of those okay guys so we are not utilizing the resource up to its capacity that is when we have certain spare capacities in it so this particular spare capacity is known as slack so keep that in mind and then we have surplus as well what is surplus well when we use more resources than what is available then that then that is known as surplus just the vice versa of slack so keep that in mind surplus occurs when more than a minimum requirement is used it is the excess over the minimum amount of constraint where the constraint is a more than or equal to constraint. So keep that in mind. So that's basically what a slack and surplus is and try to interpret what, as to what the low slack or what the high slack would mean. Okay, guys, so keep that in mind. And then we have shadow prices, which is yet again another important topic, isn't it? So what is shadow prices? Shadow price is basically the increase in contribution if we obtain one additional unit of scarce resource. Okay, guys, so keep that in mind. So let's take a look. Dual or shadow, uh, yeah, shadow or dual price is a limiting factor of a limiting factor is the increase in contribution created by the availability of one additional unit of the limiting factor at the original cost. Okay, guys, so this particular increase in contribution will be the maximum amount that can be paid to, to obtain that ad one additional unit of scarce resource, isn't it? So keep that in mind. That's basically the idea behind shadow price. And what else? We have, we then look at certain markets, isn't it? So when we talk about markets, there are uh, two different types of market structures. That is perfect markets as well as imperfect markets, isn't it? And what is perfect market? In this type of market, the firm is a price taker, okay guys? So the, the particular prices will be dependent upon certain factors such as the uh, supply and demand within that particular market. So keep that in mind. And that is, it takes its price from the industry. Okay, guys, there will be a lot of competitors in this particular market. And therefore, we won't be able to uh, set whatever prices that we want. Okay, guys, we will, we, we will need to set a price so that we can be, we can remain competitive in that particular market. So keep that in mind. So no market participant influences the price of the product. It buys or sells. Okay, guys, so the market participant doesn't necessarily have the authority or doesn't necessarily have the particular power in order to control the prices okay guys it depends upon the market itself or the market condition so keep that in mind and then we have imperfect market as well in imperfect market they are price makers okay guys the market participants are the price makers so some examples of imper imperfect markets are 
monopoly, monopolistic competition and oligopoly. Monopoly is where there is only a single seller of that particular product. And of course, he can fix whatever price he wants, isn't it? However, there can be certain government restrictions. So keep that in mind. And then there is monopolistic competition, which is yet again where we have <clears throat> a large number of suppliers. However, they deal with similar products. Okay, guys, they will deal with similar products. What does this mean? They don't deal with identical products. Okay, guys, each and every product will be different in their own way. Okay, guys, that's basically the idea behind a particular monopolistic competition. We have a few number of suppliers. However, the particular products will be similar rather than identical. That's basically the idea here. And then for oligopoly, we have a few suppliers, okay guys, there are only a few sellers in the particular market. And of course, they would have an agreement upon each other so that other, uh, you know, one particular seller won't have unnecessary advantage over the other, okay guys, so that's basically it. For example, in setting prices, they would have an agreement between one another so that they can maximize their own profits. That's basically it, okay guys, they have an understanding with each other, a mutual understanding. So that's basically the idea behind oligopoly. So keep that in mind. So that's basically all about the markets. Also learn about all the features regarding the markets. Okay guys, well, those are really important points. And what else? We will be taking a look at price elasticity of demand, which is kind of a common demand topic, isn't it? So what exactly are we looking at here? So before taking a look at price elasticity, what you have to understand is the relationship between demand and price, isn't it? So when price increases, demand decreases and the vice versa can happen as well, isn't it? So now let's talk about price elasticity. What is exa what exactly is that? It's basically the extent to which demand will fall when price will rise and vice versa. You know, that's basically the uh, aspect here. Now let's take a look. It is a measure of the extent of change in market demand for the goods in response to a change in price. So if, it, if there is a change in price, then how much will the quantity be changed? That's basically what we're looking at here, isn't it? So keep that in mind. And of course, there is a equation for that, isn't it? So what is the equation for price elasticity? The change in the quantity demanded as a percent divided by change in price as a percent of price, isn't it? So this is as a percent of quantity demanded. So this is basically the equation for price elasticity of demand. Now let's take a look at price elasticity and the pricing decisions. So what all things do we have here? If there is an inelastic demand, then the price should be increased. Why? Because a change in price can lead to a less than change in demand okay guys uh, it, compared to the change in price the demand uh, the change in demand quantity demanded would be small okay guys, smaller so that's basically the idea here therefore we can definitely increase price what else elasticity of demand el elasticity demand in this particular situation increase in price will decrease the revenue and vice versa okay guys so keep that in mind and if the demand is very elastic then what happens then Overpricing can lead to a massive drop in quantity sold, while underpricing can lead to stock outs as well. Okay, guys, so these are extreme positions, so keep that in mind. And if the particular demand is very inelastic, then it is not sensitive to price, quality, services, product mix, and location are therefore important. Okay, guys, so price is not that sensitive, therefore, it's not that much of a relevant factor. It is relevant, but it is not that much of a relevant factor because there are more important factors to focus on such as the quality of, uh, of the product, the service provided and the product mix, the location in which you are selling that particular product, etc. Okay guys, all these factors will be important in that situation. So keep that in mind. Then we look at the demand equation, isn't it? What is the demand equation? P equals A minus BQ, isn't it? So using this particular equation, this is the equation for the demand curve. So keep that in mind. And using this equation, you will be able to solve certain equations which we are yet to learn isn't it so we have to take a look at the marginal revenue for that as well so keep this in mind now let's take a look at profit maximizing output level price or output level so what are we doing here 
we are taking a look at the optimum price as well as the output level at which we can maximize profit, isn't it? So let's, how do you how do you identify that? Well, we know that MC equals MR, isn't it? So using that particular concept and the MR equation and the demand equation, we will be able to determine this. Okay, guys. So let's take a look. Profits are maximized when marginal cost equals marginal revenue. The optimum selling price can be determined by deriving equations of MC and MR. Alternatively, the optimum selling price can also be determined using tabular method as well. Okay, guys. So there is a tabular method in order to calculate that as well as a algebraic method as well. Okay, guys. So what you can do is you can use the two equation that is uh, the demand equation that which is P equal A minus BQ as well as the MR equation which is P equal A minus 2BQ. Okay, guys. Using these equations, you will be able to obtain as to what the top, uh, what what the optimum level of uh, quantity would be, uh, uh, as well as the optimum price at which you can maximize profit. Okay, guys. And what is A? How do you calculate A? Well, you, you know, with the given information, you can substitute values in order to calculate A, isn't it? And B, what is the equation for B? B is basically change in price divided by change in quantity demanded. As simple as that. Okay, guys. So keep that in mind. So after finding that out, what can we do? We can, uh, after, first of all, you have to find the value of B and then A and then apply that particular equation to the MR equation and then find the optimum quantity level. And after finding the optimum quantity level, apply that particular uh, numbers into the demand equation to identify the optimum price as simple as that. That's basically how you calculate it, isn't it? So keep that in mind. And then we look at certain pricing strategies. Okay, guys, so what all pricing strategies are we looking at here? First of all, we will look at the cost plus pricing. So what, what are we doing here? This is a traditional method in setting prices, isn't it? What do we do? We uh, calculate the cost and add a profit percentage to it to calculate the selling price. So there are two methods to do this. Either we can take the full cost plus pricing or marginal cost plus pricing. In the full cost plus pricing, what are we doing here? We are taking the full cost or the total cost of production and then adding a profit element to it or we can just use the variable cost and add a profit to it okay guys so that's basically two methods of uh, cost plus pricing so keep that in mind and then there's another pricing strategy known as market skimming isn't it so what is market skimming all about well what we do is we initially charge a high price for the product and gain the maximum profit as we can at the beginning stage itself and after that, what we can do is we can either add a few features to extend its life cycle or we can gradually decrease its price. Okay, so that's basically the idea here. So it, won't, it involves charging high prices when a new product is first launched on the market in order to maximize short term profitability. Okay, so that's basically the idea here. Okay, so that's basically all about market skimming. Now let's take a look at market penetration. Okay, so let's take a look at that. It is a policy of low prices when a product first launched in order to obtain strong demand for the product. As soon as it is launched on the market, low prices should encourage bigger demand. Okay, so initially we will be charging low prices, isn't it? So after charging low prices, we will obtain strong demand for it, isn't it? So that's basically by why we use this. And one of the things that you should remember here is the appropriate situations in which you can use this particular uh, pricing strategy for example uh, for market skimming we can use this particular pricing strategy for innovative products isn't it so keep that in mind and as for market penetration these are basically uh, used by companies who wish to enter into a new market you okay, guys so keep that in mind and what else then we have complementary product pricing when we have complementary products for example bread and butter or printers or in cartridges etc so what we can do is we can use this particular pricing strategy for those kinds of product. So here, what are complementary products? These are basically products which are dependent upon one another. Okay, guys, so that's basically the idea. So these are goods that tend to be bought and used together. If an organization makes and sells complementary product, it may wish to decide the selling prices of the products in a single pricing policy decision. Okay, so in a single pricing policy decision, we are determining the price of both these products. Okay, guys, so we sometimes what they do is they may charge, for example, in the case of uh, uh, printers and in cartridges, we may charge a lower price for uh, in uh, sorry printers and we charge a higher price for, for in cartridges. Isn't it? So that's basically the idea behind complementary product pricing. And then we look at the product line pricing. So what is the product line pricing all about? Let's take a look. 
it is a group of products that are related to one another product line may be a range of branded products as a consistent pricing policy should be applied to all products in the range okay guys so keep that in mind as simple as that there will be various product lines and it will determine a consistent pricing policy for each product line so keep that in mind and then we have volume discounting what is this well when you buy products in bulk what's going to happen is you may provide certain discount isn't it so that's basically it okay guys I mean, if a customer purchases let's say a large volume of a, of a product then we can provide certain discounts to it okay guys due to and this particular discount is charged due to our cost savings so keep that in mind as well so the reduction in price given for larger than average purchases is called volume discount as simple as that and then we have price discrimination what is this all about let's take a look it is the pra practice of charging different prices for the same product to different groups of buyers when these prices are not reflective of cost differences so for different market segments or different targeted customers we charge different prices that's basically what price discrimination is all about okay guys so that's basically the idea here and then another aspect to it is co relevant cost pricing so what is relevant cost pricing Relevant cost approach may be required to calculate. Well, we use this for special orders, okay, guys? Not the normal products that we so sell. We use it for special orders to a or a special contract of a particular customer, okay, guys? So keep that in mind. And the relevant cost approach may be required to calculate the price of special orders. It is to identify a price at which the organization may be no better off, no worse off if it sells the item at that price. Any price in excess of the minimum price will add to net profit. So the idea here is to provide that particular service or accept that particular special contract at a uh, no better off or no worse off uh, price. Okay guys, so that's basically the idea here. So what is that minimum price exactly? The minimum price, it is the incremental cost of producing and selling the item and the opportunity cost of the resources consumed in making and selling the item. So what is it? It is the incremental cost plus the opportunity cost in making that item. That is basically the minimum cost. And this should be the minimum cost that we can charge for that special contract. Any amount in excess of that will create a profit, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. Then we look at further short term decisions such as the make or buy decision. So what is uh, the make or buy decision all about? Well, here we have a choice, isn't it? We can either produce our products in house or we can either outsource it. Okay, guys, that's basically the idea here. We can subcontract it to an external supplier as well. How do you decide that? Well, this is done by taking a look at the differential cost if there is no limiting factor. If there is no limiting factor, then we can take a look at the differential cost of each item and then decide, uh, make a decision. Or what we can do is if there is a limiting factor, we can look at the cost saved by outsourcing or producing in-house and divide it by the uh, limiting factor saved. Okay, guys, so that's basically the uh, another method of calculating it. So keep that in mind. So, what are we doing here? We're basically prioritizing goods, isn't it? And then decide as to whether to make or buy. So, keep that in mind. And then we have outsourcing. What is outsourcing? Or in order to sound more cooler, let's say business process outsourcing. Well, it involves the use of external suppliers for finished products, components or services. This is also known as contract manufacturing or subcontracting. What are we doing here? Well, since we already have the uh, we are exceeding the capacity to make in-house, we can outsource the additional uh, capacity or additional uh, unsatisfied demand to a subcontractor so that we can meet that particular demand. Isn't it? That's basically the idea here. And yet another factor would be further processing decisions as well. Isn't it? Please practice questions relating to these topics because these are really important. Okay, guys. So what is further processing decision all about? Let's take a look. It involves joint products from a common manufacturing process. Decision is whether to sell the products at the split off point as soon as they emerge from the common process or whether they should be processed further before selling them. So we have joint products and we're planning as to whether to sell the particular product itself or further product one of the uh, extra joint product that we are using. Okay, guys, as simple as that. Okay, that's basically what further processing decision is all about. Well, let's take an example the wood and sodas 
wood can be manufactured into uh, the furnitures, isn't it? That's basically what we normally do. However, the sawdust, we can either sell the sawdust for its scrap value or what we can do is we can further manufacture it in order to create, let's say, handicraft materials, etc. Okay, guys, something like that. So, we are deciding as to whether we should further manufacture sawdust, isn't it? So, in order to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to compare the revenue that we will obtain by selling the product itself, that is the sawdust itself, and then compare it with the revenue that we will obtain after manufacturing, after further processing it. Okay, guys? So, after further processing it, there will be revenue as well as costs in it. So, we net off it to identify the profit and then compare it with the revenue of the sawdust if we sell it on its own. And if uh, whichever is better, we choose that alternative. That's basically what we do in further processing decisions. So, keep that in mind. Next would be shutdown decisions. What is shutdown decisions all about? Shutdown or discontinuance problems may be simplified as shorter and relevant cost decisions. It is whether to close down an operation or stop making and selling a particular product or service. So we are deciding as to whether we should shut down or close down a particular division or department or product line. Okay, so that's basically the idea behind here. And what we have to do is we have to take a look at all the additional cost involved, such as the redundancy payments or compensations, etc. And the cost savings as well. Because, for example, future losses may be saved, isn't it? That's basically another uh, aspect to consider here. However, we are not looking at the... Uh, yeah, that's basically it. Okay, guys, that's basically the things that we should consider in shutdown decisions. So, keep that in mind. And then we have another topic that is risk and uncertainty. Now, what is the difference between risk and uncertainty here? Risk is a situation or event when the particular probability can be assigned to each and every outcome, isn't it? That's basically what risk is all about. However, in uncertainty, we cannot assign probability to each of the uncertain factors. Okay, guys, that's basically the main difference here. Let's take a look. Risk is a situation or events which may or may not occur, but whose probability of occurrence can be estimated statistically. Uncertain events are those events where the outcome cannot be estimated with a statistical probability. So that's basically the main difference between these two items. Now, let's, see, let's, let's talk about the risk preference. What kind of risk preference do individuals have? Or what kind of attitudes do people have towards risk? Let's, let's talk about that. There are people who are risk seekers, risk neutral and risk averse, isn't it? Risk seekers are optimists who are, who are willing to take risks. However, risk neutral people have a balanced mindset, okay guys, they are indifferent as to whether they take the risk or not. So that's basically the idea. They have a balanced attitude to risk and risk covers people, well, they try to avoid risk, okay guys, so keep that in mind. Let's take a look. Risk seekers is one who is interested in the best outcomes, no matter how small the chances they may occur. So they don't mind the probability, they always follow the best outcome and why? Because the best outcome has the highest level of risk, isn't it? So keep that in mind. That's basically why, uh, what, who risk seekers are. And then we have decision makers uh, can be risk neutral if they appear to make a decision that balances risk and return. Okay. They are willing to take more, uh, take on more risk, but only if the expected profit or return is higher, they will only accept a lower return for lower risk. So if you're getting a lower uh, lower return, then you have to take lower risk. However, if you're getting a higher return, then they are willing to take higher risk. That's basically the attitude of a risk neutral uh, attitude. And what about the last one, risk covers? Risk covers decision makers are those who act on the assumption that the worst outcome might occur and will make a decision that limits or minimizes the risk. So what they try to do is they try to take the minimum risk to obtain the maximum outcome okay guys or the best outcome okay guys best outcome with minimum risk that's basically what they're chasing after so keep that in mind so that's basically the attitudes of all three of these uh risk uh, risk seekers the risk neutral as well as the risk averse attitude okay guys so keep that in mind and what else we have expected values as well isn't it so what are expected values these are weighted averages okay guys weighted averages of what weighted average outcome okay guys so keep that in mind let's take a look it is the weighted average value of the different possible outcomes from a decision where weightings are based on probability of each outcome. So we take a look at all the different outcome of a particular decision and take the weighted average outcome of that de decision by considering the probability of each outcome. That's basically what we do in 
expected values, isn't it? And how do you calculate it? Well, you basically multiply sigma px, isn't it? What is sigma px? It is the sum of all the probabilities at the all the outcomes, isn't it? That's basically it, value of all outcomes. And then we look at the, we, all, we should also take a look at the advantages and disadvantages of expected values as well. For example, one of the advantages of, uh, sorry, one of the disadvantages of expected values would be the fact that it can only be used for continuous decision making. Isn't it? For one off decision, expected value is not that an attractive option. And of course, it's an average figure. So the uh, outcome that we calculate as the average figure may not actually occur, isn't it? So there's a lot, lot of disadvantages relating to this as well. So learn all those advantages as well as disadvantages. Okay, guys, so keep that in mind. And then we take a look at maximum, maximax and minimax regret rules. Okay, so let's take a look. For maximum decision rule, what are we doing here? When a decision maker should select the alternative that offers the least unattractive worst outcome, it would mean choosing the alternative that maximizes the minimum profits. So we are taking a look at each decision options. We are, there are two things in a payoff table, that is there would be decision options, which is basically the decision that you have to take. And of course the circumstances or the particular outcome itself, isn't it? So. What you have to do is in a uh, maximum approach, first of all, you take a look at each decision options and identify the minimum outcome, okay guys, which is the minimum outcome. And then what you have to do is you have to choose the maximum out of these minimum outcomes selected, isn't it? So that's basically what we do in maximum approach. And this approach is usually taken by risk averse attitudes, okay guys, so keep that in mind. Secondly, we have the maximax criterion. Now, how does this work? Let's take a look. It looks as the best possible result. It means maximize the maximum profit, isn't it? The decision with this rule is to choose the option that would provide the maximum possible profit. So these, this particular criteria is mainly used by risk seekers. Why? To choose the best possible outcome. What we do is we take a look at each decision option and out of these decision option, we select the maximum outcomes and out of these selected maximum outcomes, we choose the one with the maximum outcome. That's basically it. Okay, guys, maxi max. We look at the maximum uh, of the maximum and select the maximum. That's basically the idea here. And then we have minimax regret rule. Okay, guys, so the idea here is that we should minimize the regret, isn't it? So what you can do is you can take a look at each of the outcomes or the circumstances and calculate the regret of each outcome. And then what you can do is you can take a look at each of the uh, decision options. After calculating the regret, you have to take a look at each of the decision option and select the outcomes where the particular regret is minimum, isn't it? So that's basically what you have to do there. And then what you can do is you can select the, sorry, you can first of all select the uh, regrets in the decision options where there is the maximum regret and out of that you have to select the minimum regret isn't it so that's basically the idea here so keep that in mind it aims to minimize the regret from making the wrong decision regret is the opportunity lost through making the wrong decision isn't it so that's basically the idea here so what exactly are decision trees these are a pictorial method of showing the different decision options in a given situation and the possible outcomes from each decision option. So that is basically what a decision tree is all about. So keep that in mind. And then we have value of perfect information as well. So what are the, what is, what exactly is this? Well, it is information that predicts with 100% accuracy what the outcome, uh, outcome situation will be. So if we have accurate information, what should be that particular value of that information? How do you calculate that? Well, all you do is you deduct the expected value that we calculate normally with the expected value with perfect information, isn't it? So expected value minus expected value with perfect information is the value of perfect information. So keep that in mind. And then we have value of imperfect information as well. And how do you calculate that? By deducting the value of, pro sorry, expected value of profits without the information minus uh, from the expected value of profit with imperfect information. Okay, guys, so keep that in mind and practice questions relating to it so that you can get a better understanding as to what it is. Okay, guys, so keep that in mind. Then we look at sensitivity analysis, isn't it? So what did we learn here? It is a term used to describe any technique whereby the decision options are tested for their vulnerability to changes in any variable, such as expected sales volume, sales price per unit, material cost, and labor cost. So this is basically what a sensitivity analysis is all about, isn't it? We look at 
each of the key variables and what we are going to discuss is what exactly would be the change in profit if one of these key variables changes, isn't it? That's basically what we're calculating in sensitivity analysis. And what would be the equation here? The equation would be profit divided by the key variable, isn't it? And that particular change, you guys, that will lead to a percentage change, isn't it? This particular percentage indicates that it will be the uh, change in that particular key variable that should lead to the profit becoming zero. Okay, guys, so that's basically the idea behind this particular equation. So keep that in mind. That's basically all about sensitivity analysis. Moving on to simulation model. It is a modeling technique. Oops, sorry for that. Yeah, it is a modeling technique used mainly in capital investment appraisal decisions, isn't it? So what are we doing here? We are using computer simulations in order to identify all the different outcomes okay guys all possible outcomes and then making a decision okay guys it can be really complex however it is quite useful isn't it because we have a lot of information and there is a possibility that we'll be able to make more accurate decisions as well so each and every analysis has their own advantages and disadvantages so keep that in mind be it cvp analysis be it sensitivity or be it simulation so you have to understand the advantages and disadvantages as well it is really important so keep that in mind as well okay guys so yeah, that's basically the aspect here. Now, moving on to the next syllabus area, isn't it? So that is part D, budgeting and control. So folks, speaking about, speaking about budgets, what exactly is it all about? Budgets are basically quantitative targets set to, so that we can achieve performance to a satisfactory level, isn't it? So we will be more motivated in order to achieve that budget and by achieving it, we will be excelling in our performance in the organization. That's basically why we set budgets, isn't it? Now speaking about budgets, what is the objective of setting that? Well, there are a fairly a lot of objectives such as it is compels planning. It can be used as a control measure, etc. Okay, guys. And yet another factor to consider is regarding planning and controlling. We should look at all the uh, planning and control cycles, the uh, setting the difficulty level of budgets, etc. So what exactly did we learn about setting the difficulty levels of budget? The budget's difficulty level should be fixed appropriately. Why? Because if you can fix the difficulty level at the appropriate level, then the employees will be motivated in order to achieve that particular budget, isn't it? Otherwise, what can happen is they won't, they will get demotivated. The staff morale will decrease. What is morale? Basically, the motivation to work for the company. Okay, guys, so keep that in mind. So, that's basically first of all, the some of the basic aspects that you should consider in budgeting. Therefore, what we can do is we can make them participate in the budget setting. Isn't it? We can make the employees as well as lower level managers participate in the budget setting process so that they'll be a bit more motivated. However, when we talk about that, there are two types of budget involving this participation, isn't it? That is, first of all, there are top down budgets, which is which has zero level participation, isn't it? These are all imposed budget. The senior level management will impose this budget to the lower level without considering their opinions and views. Okay, guys, that's basically the idea behind top down budgeting. So do you think that they will be motivated to work for the organization if we implement top down budgeting? No, not really, isn't it? So keep that in mind. So top down budgeting are targets that are set at the senior management level. Okay, guys, so just impose the budget. That's basically it. And please learn all the advantages and disadvantages relating to this. Okay, guys, so keep that in mind. One of the uh, main disadvantages that the employees won't be motivated, isn't it? So keep that, keep that in mind. And the advantages could be, you know, that it could be, uh, you know, imposed a, uh, a bit more quicker manner. There's no, it's not a time consuming process, so it can be created easily. So keep that in mind. And then we have bottom up budgeting or in other words, past participative budgets, isn't it? So in bottom up budgeting, what happens is we include the lower level managers in setting the budgets. Therefore, they would be more motivated into achieving that budget. Okay, guys. So the budgeting process starts at a relatively lower level of management. However, there are certain disadvantages to this as well, such as it's a time consuming process. You have to take into account all the opinions and views of each and every lower level managers and then create the budget, which is a time consuming process in it. So keep that in mind. And then we look at various other different types of budgets, such as the incremental budget, first of all, which is the normal way of budgeting, isn't it? So what are we doing here? 
in order to create a new budget, we'll say the next year's budget, what we do is we take the current year's actual results and make some adjustments such as uh, some percentage increases and decreases and adjustments for inflation and other aspects and then create the next year's budget and that's how we create the next year's budget. So what exactly are the advantages and disadvantages here? The advantage is that it will be more suitable for a organization with a stable environment, isn't it? The disadvantages is that we will be carrying forward the previous year's inefficiencies. So learn all the advantages and features of each and every budgeting technique. Okay guys, so keep that in mind. So this is the budgeting method in which the next year's budget is prepared by using the current year's actual results as a starting point and making adjustments to for expected inflation, sales growth, decline and other known changes, isn't it? As simple as that. And then we move on to the next type of budgeting that is zero based budgeting. So what is zero based budgeting all about then? Well, here we don't take the previous year's inefficiencies or anything. We will start everything from scratch, isn't it? That's basically the idea behind zero based budgeting and it is more suitable for organizations that have a projects project based business model isn't it so that's basically the idea here so let's take a look this involves preparing for a, preparing a budget for each cost center or activity from zero or scratch base every item of expenditure has to be justified in its entirety in order to be included in the next year's budget so what we are going to do is well what is the step by step process of implementing zero based budget let's discuss about that first of all we have to define decision packages isn't it what are decision packages these are certain activities that are to be conducted in the organization such as new projects etc okay guys and then what we do is we evaluate and rank isn't it evaluate and rank each decision package okay guys so we take a look at each and every decision packages and we evaluate them on the basis of their cost and benefits if the cost exceeds the benefit, then we reject them. And if the benefits exceed cost, then we uh, include them in our budget. Okay, guys, so that's basically what we do, do here. And of course, after ranking, what we do is, after ranking them, we will allocate resources, isn't it? Allocate resources to that particular activity. That's basically the process of implementing zero-based budget, uh, budget. So keep, the, keep that in mind. Now, what are the advantages and disadvantages here? The advantage is that, yes, we are all, you know, cat, uh, starting out everything from scratch. Therefore, there won't be any inefficiencies or wastages, isn't it? So keep that in mind. And the disadvantage here is that it's a time consuming process. Okay, guys, it is expensive as well as time consuming and requires a lot of or a huge amount of management effort as well. And then we move on to the next type of budget that is rolling budgets. So what are rolling budgets? Well, these are continuously updated, isn't it? So keep that in mind. And these type of budgets are more suitable for organizations that operate in a flexible environment or a dynamic environment. Okay, guys, so keep that in mind. That's the appropriate word there. This is a budget which is continuously updated by adding a further accounting period, a month or a quarter, to the end of the budget when the earliest period in the current budget has entered. So after the actual uh, results of the first quarter has occurred what we're going to do is so this is the, basically how you create the budget okay guys first of all you create a budget for the entire year and then after the first month or quarter what we do is we take a look at the actual results and if it is if there is too much variation in the particular budget then what we do is we revise the budget for the rest of the year okay guys so that's basically how we create rolling budgets isn't it so keep that in mind so these kinds of budgets are continuously updated and therefore yet again this kind of budget involves a lot of management effort as well as it's really expensive as well isn't it because continuously updating budgets is really expensive and a time consuming process so keep that in mind next we look at activity based budgeting not costing budgeting isn't it so what are we doing here we are applying the ABC principle or activity based costing principles to the budgeting process. Okay, guys, so what are we doing here exactly? We are focusing more on the cost drivers. Whenever the word ABC comes up, remember cost drivers. Okay, guys, so this type of budget involves defining the activities and the uh, that underlie the financial figures in each function and use the level of activity to de decide how much resource should be allocated and how well it is being managed and to explain variances from budgets. Okay, guys, so that's basically 
how we use activity based budgets we take a look at the uh, driving factors of each and every cost that should be included in the budget and then we set, uh, fix the budget that's basically how we do it one of the main advantages of this is that by taking a look at the cost drivers we will be able to identify as to what is the what is causing that particular cost and fig, uh, related figures isn't it therefore what we can do is we can eliminate non value adding activities and improve efficiency in the business processes okay guys so that's one of the main advantages of activity based budgeting disadvantage is that well it has the same disadvantage as that of activity based costing such as the fact that the cost drivers may be difficult to identify or uh, there could be the yeah it's the fact that it's expensive and time consuming etc and these kinds of budgets okay guys activity based budget is more suitable for certain complex organizations so keep that in mind so that's basically all the all about the types of budget isn't it and then what we learned was we learned about a uh, new way of thinking isn't it rather than the traditional budgeting method that is beyond budgeting so what is beyond budgeting all about well this concept foils the whole idea of budgeting because it proposes the idea that traditional budgeting should be abandoned isn't it so the idea that it proposes is that the traditional approach to budgeting is not that great so let's just abandon it and let's focus on beyond budgeting so what is beyond budgeting remember the mnemonic foil in order to understand as to what it means okay guys so what is foil stands for f o i l f is stands for the freedom of management to make <clears throat> to make their own decisions isn't it so the freedom of management to make their own decisions that's the first feature of beyond budgeting and then o stands for organizational benefit so what does organizational benefit mean by the way it basically means that management could focus more on the organization and customers rather than just you know making sure as to whether everyone has achieved the target or not okay guys so they're uh, focusing on the customers and related aspects is more important than this isn't it so management effort should be more focused on the customers as well as the organization as a whole rather than just focusing on setting budgets okay guys that's basically the idea proposed by this beyond budgeting concept so keep that in mind and then we have i i stands for one second there we go i stands for information systems So what does information system mean? This means that there should be sufficient level of information system so that the managers can receive the right decision, right information at the right time to make the appropriate decision. And what are information system? These are basically a set of components that are basically hardwares and softwares, isn't it? So keep that in mind. And L, my dear friend, stands for long term, isn't it? Long term focus or long term view. So that's basically the idea behind foil so keep that in mind so that's basically as to what it mean what exactly is long term we should focus on the long term rather than achieving short term targets that's basically what this means okay guys these are the four features of beyond budgeting we also learned about certain disadvantages as well isn't it so keep that in mind and learn these and we also learned about certain criticisms of budgeting as well what are the criticism it's basically that uh, budgeting process is time consuming and they are too fixed and they uh, they try to protect costs rather than reduce them so think things like that okay guys so remember all these theoretical aspects because these are all really important in the exam now what else after beyond budgeting we look at the changes changing budgetary systems so if we are planning to change the budgetary system of our organization what all difficulties will we face let's take a look at that well first of all there would be resistance by employees isn't it the employees will definitely resist the fact that the particular budgetary system is changing because you know they have to learn something new which is a time consuming process and most people don't like that isn't it so that's basically why the employees will resist themselves and of course there is loss of control and there should be there would be certain cost for implementing the new system and then training will be required for the new employees and of course there could be lack of accounting information because managers they don't really have much knowledge they may not really have much knowledge relating to the new system therefore 
uh, they will lack the information. If they lack the information, they won't be able to use that particular budgetary system in an efficient and effective manner. Okay, guys. So that's basically some of the difficulties that may be faced by the managers. So keep that in mind. Moving on to the next aspect. Now we are looking at high-low method. So what is high-low method? Well, it is the quantitative technique for analyzing the total cost into their fixed and variable elements. So there are mixed costs, in it, or in other words, semi-variable or semi-fixed costs. So what we are doing is we are splitting that particular total cost into its variable element as well as fixed element. How do we do that? Well, it's easy. We just apply the following information or following formula. That's basically cost. <coughs> cost at the highest activity minus cost at the lowest activity divided by the highest activity minus lowest activity. This will give us the variable cost per unit. Okay guys. And then what we can do is we can just apply this particular variable cost per unit to the total cost function. What is the total cost? It's basically fixed cost minus variable cost, isn't it? So if you apply, uh, you we already know the total cost that's already given to you and then you have the variable cost. Then you just have to deduct these figures to identify the fixed cost, isn't it? Uh, so as simple as that, that's basically how you calculate it, okay guys? So remember that. So that's basically all about the high-low method. And then we will look at the learning curve, which is yet another important theory, isn't it? So keep that in mind. So the learning curve theory applies to situations where the workforce as a whole improves in efficiency with experience. So when you produce the first unit, it may take like 100, 100 hours. However, when you take the second and third unit, then you learn from your first experience and take lesser time, isn't it? So that's basically the concept behind learning curve. So keep that in mind. And the learning effect or learning curve effect describes the speeding up of a job with repeated performance, isn't it? So keep that in mind. So that's basically the idea behind learning curve. And remember guys, the learning effect is not indefinite, isn't it? So after a certain point, the particular learning curve will end, you guys. And after that point, what we can do is we can set the standard labor time as well as the standard labor cost. So okay, guys, so keep that in mind. So that's yet another important point. And there are two methods into solving a uh, learning curve problem, isn't it? What exactly is that? There is the tabular approach as well as the uh, algebraic approach as well, isn't it? So remember that the algebraic approach will be given to you. The formula for that would be given to you in your exam. So don't worry about that. And what about the tabular approach? Uh, that won't be given. You have to learn that. Okay, guys, learn that format. First of all, we have the accumulative number of output that is one, two, four, eight, etc. And then you have the uh, cumulative average time taken per unit and then the cumulative uh, total time taken uh, taken and then you have to calculate the incremental times etc okay guys as simple as that that's basically how you create the table and you need to know that because there the questions can be relating to either of these methods you will be either you you should either use the algebraic method or the tabular method okay guys so both methods are really important so learn both these methods okay guys so keep that in mind then you have the use of standard costs. What are standard costs exactly? These are estimated cost per unit, isn't it? And what are budget budgeted costs? These are total figures, okay guys? So budgeted costs are total figures, whereas, whereas standard costs are cost per unit. Therefore, what you have to understand here is that in order to calculate a standard cost, you need to know the level of output. Whereas in order to calculate the budgeted cost, you don't necessarily need to know that, okay guys? So keep that in mind. And a standard cost is an estimated unit cost built up of standard for each cost element, standard resource price and standard resource usage. Standard costing has three main uses, which are, well, basically the three main uses are as follows. That is, we can use it to value inventory. We can use it as a control device. And what else can we use it as? We can use it to budget production costs as well. Okay, guys, so keep that in mind. So now let's take a look at the types of standards, shall we? So well, how many types of standards are there? 
four standards, isn't it? So what are these? Well, first of all, there is the ideal standards. What, what are ideal standards exactly? This is basically the targets that can be achieved at perfect working conditions. That is, there should be zero wastages and zero inefficiencies. Okay, guys, so that's basically the idea behind ideal standards. So let's read about it. An ideal standard is one which can be attained oops, under perfect operating conditions. That is, no wastage, no inefficiency, no ideal time and no breakdowns. So without any sort of inefficiencies and without any sort of wastages, what is the level of output that we can achieve or what is the target that we can achieve? That is basically what ideal standards is all about. So keep that in mind. And then we have attainable standards as well, isn't it? So what are attainable standards? An attainable standard is a standard which can be attained if production is carried out efficiently, machines are properly oper operated and or materials are properly used. Some allowance is made for wastage and inefficiencies as well. Okay. So that's basically what attainable standards is all about, isn't it? So keep that in mind. Now, one thing that you have to identify, uh, uh, know here is that we do include some sort of inefficiencies, okay guys, why? So that can be attainable, okay guys. The employees should feel that they can achieve this particular target so that they'll be motivated to achieve it. Yes, yeah, so that's basically the idea that you have to understand here. And what else? Then we also have current standards as well, isn't it? So what is a current standard? A current standard is a standard which is based on current working conditions that is current wastage and current inefficiencies as well. So we take into consideration the current inefficiencies that are within the working environment and then prepare the standards. Okay guys, the idea here is that, well, some employees may find it motivating whereas some others won't. Okay guys, because it doesn't promote improvement. You are just attaining the current standards and that's basically it. The employees are not motivated, you know, to improve themselves, isn't it? So keep that in mind. And finally, we have the fourth type of standard that is basic standards. So what exactly are these? A basic standard is a long-term standard which remains unchanged over the years and is used to show trends as well. Hey guys, so what are we doing? We are taking a look at long-term long standards. However, the basic risk here is that it may be out of date, okay guys, that's a possibility that basic standards may be out of date because we're not changing it for a long term, isn't it? So that's basically why that's the case, so keep that in mind. So that's basically all about the four, uh, four types of standards and you should understand the motivation level at each of these standards as well. For example, for current, basic and for, for basic and ideal standards, the motivation level would be kind of low, okay guys. The, at the basic level, the, it, it, it could, the employees would feel that it's too easy to achieve the standard Whereas in ideal level, they may find it impossible to achieve the standard. Therefore, they will be demotivated. And another aspect is current standard. As I stated earlier, the motivation uh, you know, level is neutral because some employees may find it to be kind of motivating because yes, these, these standards can be achieved. Yes, so we can achieve it easily. However, some others who are, you know, are more interested in more difficult targets would be demotivated. And yet another factor to consider here is that it does not promote improvement. Okay, guys, so keep that in mind. And the most positive impact and motivation can be achieved by setting attainable standards. So keep that in mind. So that's basically all about types of standards. Now let's take a look at flexible and flexed budget. So let's take a look at what it is, shall we? Flexible budget is a budget which by recognizing different cost behavior patterns changes as volume of activity changes. Okay, guys? So at different output levels, what can be our budget? Uh, that is comparable. That is basically what we do in flexible budgets, isn't it? However, when we took a look at flexed budget, the case would here would be different. That is, a flexed budget is a budget prepared to show the revenue, cost and profits that would have been expected at the actual level of production and sales. So we take a look at the actual level of production and sales and then flex our budget. That is basically what a flexed budget is all about. So keep that in mind. And then we learn about the principle of controllability, which is, it means that the manager should only be held accountable for cause they have a certain degree of control over. Okay, guys, so the managers of responsibility center should only be held accountable for cause which they have some influence on. And then we take a look at variance analysis. Okay, guys, so what is variance analysis all about? Well, there is a whole lot of, in, uh, information here such as the formulas isn't it the formulas is one of the key factors that you should remember here 
So variance is the difference between actual and budgeted results and variance analysis is the analysis of this particular difference that is the variance. Okay guys, so let's take a look. A variance is the difference between the actual result and the expected result. In standard costing, cost variances are the difference between standard cost and actual cost of units produced, isn't it? As simple as that. And what about variance analysis? It is a process of process by which the total difference between standard and actual results is analyzed as simple as that. So that's basically as to what variance analysis is all about. Now, what all formulas did we learn here? These formulas are really important. So keep that in mind. And of course, there is an easy way to learn this, isn't it? Just identify the logical pattern of each and every formulas that will help you remember these okay, guys. So what about what is the material cost variance? That's basically the standard cost minus actual cost. However, more importantly, we have to identify the formulas for price and usage variance. Isn't it? So let's take a look at that. So for material price variance, we have actual quantity times standard price minus actual price. That's basically the equation. For material usage variance, we have standard price times act, uh, standard quantity minus actual quantity. So remember that. For labor total variance, that will basically yet again the difference between standard cost and actual cost. And for labor rate variance, the equation would be actual hours times standard rate minus actual, uh, actual rate. So this is kind of similar to the material price variance, isn't it? So remember that. What about the labor efficiency? We have the standard rate times standard hours minus actual hours. So we are deducting the actual from standard here, isn't it? Why? So that our product can be uh, either positive or negative. And if it is positive, it will show a favorable variance. Whereas if it is negative, it will show a adverse variance. Okay, guys, that's basically why we are deducting the actual from standard in the case of costs such as material costs as, as well as labor costs so remember that and then we have labor idle time variance which is basically you know always an adverse variance because idle time during idle time they're not providing any output isn't it so that's a waste time so uh, it's always an adverse variance so the equation would be at normal idle time times the standard rate per hour okay guys so keep that in mind and always keep an eye in your question relating to these idle time variances why because the particular idle time will not be given to you directly sometimes okay guys you have to identify as to how much is it so keep that keep an eye out for it and what about the next one we have variable overhead cost variance that is actual overhead time standard rate per unit and the uh, and minus the actual overhead cost and that's basically the equation for actual overhead cost variance however it has two subdivisions that is variable overhead expenditure variance what is the equation here actual hours times standard rate minus actual rate isn't it and the actual hours is basically the you know time taken uh, you, uh, as per the particular budgeted activity level okay guys so keep that in mind then we have variable overhead efficiency variance as well which is standard uh, rate times the standard hours minus actual hours and now moving on to the fixed overhead variance okay so now this kind uh, this could be a bit different from the others isn't it so let's take a look we have fixed overhead expenditure variance first of all and the equation would be budgeted overheads minus actual overheads okay guys we're not taking a look at the standard overheads but it's the budgeted overhead so keep that in mind and then we have the fixed overhead volume variance and the equation for this would be standard rate times the standard hours minus the budgeted hours not the actual hours the budget hours so keep that in mind and then we have subdivision for fixed overhead volume variance as well isn't it and what is that fixed overhead efficiency variance would be standard rate times standard hours minus actual hours whereas fixed overhead capacity variance would be standard rate times actual hours minus budgeted hours so keep these formulas in mind okay guys these are really important and then we move on to the sales variances that is budgeted sales minus actual sales and here the equation is vice versa we're not deducting the actual from the standard it is vice versa okay guys we're deducting the standard from the actual so remember that so what is the sales price variance it will be actual quantity times actual price minus standard price okay folks and then we have the sales volume variance and what does this mean well this is basically the standard profit or contribution times the actual quantity minus the standard quantity so keep that in mind so that's basically the idea behind sales variances so keep that in mind now we move on to mix and yield variance okay so what is this all about well 
when we speak about mixed variance and please do questions relating to this so that you can better, get a better understanding as to how to do the questions so keep that in mind so in mixed variance what are we uh, what exactly are we looking at a mixed variance arises when the materials are not mixed or blended in the standard proportions and it is a measure of whether the actual mix is cheaper or more expensive than the standard mix isn't it so that's basically actually what a mixed variance is all about we focus more on the blend or the proportion of materials used to product uh, produce the output so keep that in mind whereas in yield variance what are we focusing on the focus is more on the output okay guys have we used our input sufficiently that's basically what we are focusing on here let's take a look a yield variance arises because there is a difference between what the input should have been for the output achieved and the actual input okay guys so that's basically how to, uh, as to what the yield is okay guys we focus on the output so one thing that you have to understand here is the interrelationship between these two that is if the mixed variance is favorable then the yield variance is adverse okay guys so keep that in mind then we look at the sales mix and quantity variance so earlier the mix and yield variance related to materials or inputs used isn't it? however the sales mix and quantity variance relating to the sales output okay guys so what are we looking at the sales mix variance occurs when the proportions of various products sold are different from those in budget so we are looking at the products products mix okay guys or the sales mix that is being sold okay guys and this is basically something that we have in an organization that produces more than one product so keep that in mind and what else we have the sales quantity variance as well this shows the difference in contribution or profit okay the sales quantity variance show the difference in contribution or profit of a change in sales volume from the budgeted volume of sales okay guys so that's basically as to what a sales quantity variance uh indicates okay guys it's kind of similar to the yield variance as well so keep that in mind so that's basically all about the sales mix and quantity variance moving on to the next one that is planning and operational variances so what does this mean let's take a look well as we stated before regarding the principle of controllability we only hold, hold the hold the particular manager accountable for the cost which they have a certain degree of control over isn't it so that is why we are taking a look at planning and operational variances the planning variance indicates the variance in which the manager does not have a degree of control whereas the operational variance indicates the variances where the manager has a particular degree of control over okay guys so that's basically the idea here now let's take a look planning variances are held are calculated by comparing the original budget or standard cost with the revised standard cost okay guys so keep that in mind and then we have operational variance which are calculated in the same way as normal variances except the comparison is between actual result and the revised budget so we have a revised budget here okay guys so we are taking, taking a look at three concepts that is the standard cost or yeah the standard cost the revised cost as well as the actual cost so why are we looking at the revised one well because a budget can only be revised due to uncontrollable factors that's basically why we take a look at revised budget so keep that in mind okay guys for controllable factors you should not revise the budget so keep that in mind now another aspect that you need to uh, understand here is relating to the manipulation and other related aspect that is something called budgetary slack so what exactly is a budgetary slack let's take a look when setting the budget there may be a budgetary slack or bias why this is a deliberate overestimation of expenditure and or underestimation of revenues in the budgeting process which results in meaningless variances and a budget which is of no use for control purposes so that's basically what this budgetary slack is all about okay guys so managers may try to bias the particular budgets by either over uh, overestimating the expenditure or underestimating the revenues etc okay guys so that's basically what a budgetary slack is all about that is uh, a type of manipulation isn't it so keep that in mind so that's all for this particular topic however now we have to take a look at some equations relating to planning and operational variances isn't it so let's take a look at that so first of all let's take a look at the sales volume planning and operational variance so what exactly is the sales volume variance or the equation for the sales volume variance it's basically the standard profit or contribution times 
the actual quantity minus standard quantity, isn't it? So, in the case of planning variance of sales volume, what we can do is we can state the following equation that is standard profit or contribution times the revised quantity minus standard quantity. So, this is the equation for the sales volume planning variance. Okay, guys. So, when we take a look at the operational variance, the equation would be it again standard profit slash contribution times the actual quantity minus the revised quantity. So, in the case of planning, we are comparing the revised and standard, whereas in the case of operational, we are comparing the actual and revised. Okay, guys. So, keep that in mind. Now, that's basically all about the sales volume, planning and operational variance. Now, let's take a look at another one that is the sales price. planning and operational variance. Well, what is the sales price variance? That's basically the actual quantity minus or yeah, actual quantity sold times the actual price minus standard price, isn't it? So, when we take into account the planning variance or the sales price planning variance, the equation would be actual quantity times the revised price minus standard price. And for the operational variance, it will be actual quantity times the actual price minus revised price. Okay, guys. So, that's basically how the equation works for sales price. Okay, guys. Now, let's take a look at yet another factor, shall we? Now, let's take a look at the material price planning and operational variance. So, in the case of material price, the planning variance would be the actual quantity times the standard price minus the revised price, isn't it? Because since we are considering material cost here, we have to deduct the revised or standard from this, uh, the revised or actual from the standard, isn't it? So, keep that in mind. So, that is basically the planning variance as for operational variance, it will be actual quantity times the revised price minus actual price. So, this is this would basically be the equation for operational or material price operational variance. So, keep that in mind and then we take a look at the material usage planning and operational variance. So, in this situation, what would be the planning variance? The material usage planning variance would be the standard price, not rate, price times the revised, sorry, the standard hours minus the revised hours, isn't it? So, keep that in mind. Or, sorry, in the case of usage, it's not hours, it's quantities in it. So, the standard quantity minus the revised quantity. So, that's basically the equation for material usage planning uh, planning variance. What about the operational variance? For the operational variance, it will be standard price times the revised quantity minus actual quantity. As simple as that, okay guys. So, that's basically how to calculate the variances for material price and uh, material usage. Now, let's take a look at the planning and operational variances for labor, shall we? For labor, it's going to be first of all labor rate, isn't it? Labor rate, planning and operational variance. So, yet again, we sort of have the same equation, isn't it? However, instead of price, we have rate, isn't it? That's the only difference here. And for quantity, we have hours. Actual hours times standard rate minus the revised rate would be the equation for labor rate planning variance. What about the operational one? For the operational one, it will be actual hours times the revised rate minus actual rate. Okay, guys, as simple as that. And next, we are going to take a look at the labor efficiency planning and operational variance. Efficiency planning and operational variance. 
and the planning variance would be the standard rate times the standard quantity sorry the standard hours minus the revised hours and for operational variance it's going to be the standard rate times the revised hours minus the actual hours so this would be the equation for labor efficiency and uh, efficiency planning and operational variances okay guys so that's basically all the equations relating to planning and operational isn't it so that's all for syllabus part d budgeting and control now let's move on to another syllabus area that is part e performance measurement and control now what exactly is performance measurement all about we are measuring the performance of our organization to understand as to how far have we achieved our objectives isn't it organization objective so that is basically the main objective behind performance measurement so let's read about it this aims to establish how well something or somebody is doing in accordance to a plan okay so performance measures may be divided into two types there are financial performance indicators and non financial performance indicators so let's talk about performance indicators what are they and why are we using that well the first thing that you need to know about is regarding csfs what are csfs csfs are basically critical success factors okay guys so what are these critical success factors exactly well these are the critical areas in which a business has to excel at in order to achieve their organizational objectives because that's basically what critical success factors are and in order to measure as to how much have we extend or to what level or to what extent have we excel in these critical areas we use something called kpis or critical sorry key performance indicators okay guys so key performance indicators are the factors or measures that we use to measure the extent to which we have excelled at the critical success factors okay so that's basically how the theory works now another factor that you need to consider is the types of critical sub, uh, key performance indicators that is there are financial key performance indicators as well as non financial as well so what are these financial uh, performance indicators well basically our ratios okay guys this is basically ratio analysis so you can calculate a lot of ratios in order to identify as to what the particular financial status of that particular company is okay guys as simple as that so what all ratios can you calculate you can calculate the gross profit margin that is gross profit by sales times 100 or the net profit margin which is the net profit divided by sales times 100 or the earnings per share which is basically the earnings attributable to ordinary shareholders divided by the weighted average number of shares or you can calculate the return on capital employed which is ppit by capital employed and capital employed is basically total assets minus current liabilities isn't it or in other words we can state it as the uh, share reserves okay guys the share capital reserves plus non current liabilities as well and there are the gearing ratios as well isn't it which is basically either debt by equity or debt by debt plus equity okay guys so whatever the equation is it may be provided to you otherwise you can use whatever you want okay guys so keep that in mind and then we have the operational gearing which is contribution by pbit as well and another equation that you can use here is you can also use fixed cost by total cost to calculate the operational gearing as well okay guys and now we let's take a look at the liquidity ratios which is the current ratio isn't it what is the current ratio it's basically current assets divided by current liabilities and then we have the quick ratio or the asset test ratio which is basically current assets minus inventories divided by current liabilities and then we have the accounts receivable payment period which is straight receivables divided by credit sales times 365 days uh and then we have the accounts payable payment period which is trade payables divided by the credit purchases times 365 and the inventory turnover days which is inventory by cost of sales times 365 days okay guys you can also use another ratios as well such as the operational uh, or profit ratio which is basically the net profit ratio in other words or the uh, interest cover ratio etc okay guys so keep that in mind now Let's take a look at not-for-profit organizations, shall we? So, what is a not-for-profit organization? Their main objective is not to create profit. Instead, 
they would be they would have several other objectives that is they, they commonly have multiple objectives isn't it it could be revenue maximization provision of high quality goods and services or uh, surplus maximization what is surplus surplus is basically the excess of the particular income over expenditure whereas deficit is basically the excess of expenditure over income guys keep that in mind so Deficit and surplus are two terms that we use in a not-for-profit organization instead of profit and loss because we don't have profits, isn't it? So that's basically why. Now let's take a look. A not-for-profit organization is an organization whose attainment of its prime goal is not assessed by economic measures. Okay, guys, we don't we're not look, taking a look at the financial measures primarily here. Okay, guys. However, in pursuit of that goal, it may undertake profit-making activities. A major problem with uh, many of the not-for-profit organization is that what exactly could be the problem? Well, there are multiple objectives for one. And of course, there are a lot of non-financial aspects as well, isn't it? And measuring non-financial aspects is kind of difficult. Why? Because we need to quantify them in order to measure them. And quantifying non-financial qualitative aspects is a difficult process. That's basically why it can be difficult, okay, guys? So, and yet another factor is there could be certain restrictions on the finance available for a not-for-profit organization and there could be you know infrequent funding okay guys for example for not-for-profit not-for-profit organization the donations is not a fixed level of income isn't it, it can uh, if, if someone wants to donate then they'll receive donation otherwise they won't receive at all isn't it so keep that in mind now in order to uh, get over that objectives, what we can do is we can just take a look at the inputs rather than outputs, okay guys, because measuring output of a not-for-profit organization may be difficult. So instead, we can just measure the inputs. And another aspect that we can use is we can just use the judgment of experts into evaluating performance of not-for-profits as well. So keep that in mind. And one of the common measures used to measure the performance of a uh, not-for-profit organization is the value for money. So what is value for money? When you hear the word value for money, the three E's should come into your mind. What are the three E's? Economy, efficiency, and effectiveness, isn't it? Economy is obtaining the high quality inputs at the lowest cost. Not cheap inputs, high quality inputs at lowest cost. That's basically how you should say it. And as for efficiency, it involves maximizing the output with a given level of input. That's basically efficiency and for effectiveness, it's basically achieving targets. Okay, guys, that's basically what effectiveness is all about. So by taking a look at these three aspects, we will be able to measure the performance of a not-for-profit organization to a certain extent. So keep that in mind. So value for money means providing a service in a way in which, which is economical, efficient and effective. So effectiveness is the relationship between the organization's outputs and its objectives. Okay, guys, have the output met its objectives. That's basically it. And of course, efficiency is the relationship between inputs and outputs. Have we obtained or have we obtained the maximum output with the given level of input? And then we have economy, which is attaining appropriate quantity and quality of inputs at the lowest cost. Okay, guys, so keep that in mind. Simple as that. Then we take a look at some external consideration, okay guys, so in order to measure performance, be it for a profit organization or a not-for-profit organization, there are some external factors that you should consider as well, such as the competitor, such as the uh, market conditions, as well as the stakeholders as well, isn't it? So what are we considering regarding the stakeholders? Let's take a look at that. Stakeholders are a group of people or individuals who have a legitimate interest in the activities of an organization. They include customers, employees, the community, shareholders, suppliers, and lenders. Isn't it? So whoever has an interest in the activities of the organization, they can be called as a stakeholder. And there are three broad types of stakeholder in an organization. That is internal, connected, and external stakeholders as well, isn't it? So who are internal stakeholders? Basically, people who are within the organization, the stakeholders who are within the organization, such as the employees, the management, etc. Okay, guys. And the connected stakeholders would be the shareholders, uh, the customers, suppliers, finances, etc. And the external stakeholders would be the community, the government, pressure groups, etc. Okay, guys. So all these are the are the three broad categories of stakeholders. So keep that in mind. And then we take a look at another interesting concept that is the balance co card, isn't it? So what is this all about? Let's take a look. This approach emphasizes the need to provide management with a set of information which covers all the relevant areas of performance in an objective and unbiased fashion. Okay, so it's a particular measure or approach used to measure performance 
by covering all relevant aspects and providing information to the management regarding these all relevant aspects okay guys so the information provided could be both financial and non-financial and cover areas such as profitability customer satisfaction internal efficiency and innovation so one thing that you have to consider here is that a balanced scorecard approach focuses on the internal and external factors as well as the financial as well as non-financial factors as well okay guys so keep that in mind that's really important and yet another factor that you have to consider here is the mnemonic okay guys what is the mnemonic that you can use in order to understand all the perspectives well you can use if i see isn't it so if i see okay so what does it stands for it stands for each of the perspectives in the balance scorecard i stands for internal process efficiencies or internal process perspective and then f stands for the financial perspective i stands for innovation and learning and c stands for customer perspective so what does each of these perspective means internal process perspective what does that mean well we are focusing on the internal business processes within the organization to make sure as to whether we are you know providing achieving maximum efficiency okay guys so that's basically the idea behind internal uh, process uh, perspective and as for financial perspective we ask we are asking ourselves the question that is are we adding value to our shareholders okay guys so are we creating or maximizing the wealth of our shareholders that's basically the question that we are asking here and then we have innovation and learning so what is the question asked here are we improving ourselves that's basically it okay guys we have to learn continuously to improve ourselves isn't it so that's basically what this particular perspective focuses on and then we have the customer perspective as well where we are focusing on the fact as to whether we are adding value to the customers okay guys are we adding value to the customers or how does the customer view our company that's basically what we are focusing on in this last perspective okay guys so using if i see you can remember all the perspectives in the balance scorecard now moving on to the next approach that is fitzgerald and moon's building block model so the balance scorecard can be you know primarily be focused on the manufacturing industries whereas fitzgerald and moon's building block model is primarily focused on service organizations okay guys so, uh, organizations that have that provides services rather than goods that's basically it so let's take a look in 1996 fitzgerald and moon suggested that a performance management system in a service organization can be analyzed as a combination of three building blocks so what are these three building blocks there is dimension of performance standards and rewards okay guys so what is what is the div dimensions of performance have let's take a look at that profit quality innovation flexibility competitiveness and resource utilization so this it focuses on six, six as aspects that is first of all it focuses on the profit because of course we need the finance to live isn't it so organizations need to need the finance to live so we should focus on that and we can focus on the quality and then the innovation and flexibility competitiveness as well as resource utilization okay guys so these are the six dimensions of performance so keep that in mind and that is the first building block secondly we have standards how exactly should the standards be that is what this particular building block is all about okay guys so the qualities of a standard is ownership achievability and equity okay guys so ownership means that the employees should feel that they own the particular standard okay guys that's the first feature Secondly, the employee should feel that the standards are achievable. Okay, guys, that's yet another factor to motivate them to achieve the standards. And finally, it should be fair to all employees. Okay, guys, the standard set should be fair to all employees. So these three should be the, uh, the characteristics of a particular standard that should be set in a particular service organizations. And now we move on to the third building block that is rewards, isn't it? So in the case of rewards, what we can do is... Uh, the reward should be clearly communicated to all employees that okay if you work this much then you will get this amount of rewards etc that should be clearly communicated and then there would be motivation okay guys a reward should be set in such a way that it can motivate the particular employees to work towards the standards and then of course there should be controllability as well isn't it so what is controllability all about then 
it basically means that the particular manager or employee should only be rewarded for the things that they have a certain degree of control over okay guys or the performance level that they have a certain degree of control over that's basically it okay guys so uh, you shouldn't like reduce your rewards or you know cut out the pay if uh, the particular results was due to a fact that uh, that was outside the control of the particular employer manager that's basically the concept here so these three are the particular characteristics of the reward that you should be setting for uh, people in a particular service organization so keep that in mind now that's basically it for the building block model now let's take a look at divisionalization shall we so what is divisionalization all about well this is a term for the division of an organization each division manager is responsible for the performance of that division a division may be what a division can be divided into various departments and branches isn't it so that's basically what is stated here okay guys so an organization can be divided into certain divisions or yeah certain divisions for example let's say division a or division b isn't it so that's basically what the divisionalization is all about okay guys so there are certain advantages and disadvantages to it so please learn about that and the aspect that we are primarily focusing on here is the performance measurement of such divisions how exactly can we measure the performance of such division let's take a look at that shall we first of all we can use roi or return on investment isn't it so let's take a look at as to what it is so roi shows how much profit has been made in relation to the amount of capital invested isn't it so how do you calculate that it's basically pbit or profit before interest and tax divided by capital employed isn't it and capital employed is basically the total assets minus the total current liabilities isn't it as simple as that another key aspect that you should understand here is that the roi is the product of the profit margin times asset turnover why well let's take a look at the equation what is the equation for profit margin it will be pbit or profit before interest and tax divided by the sales isn't it and asset turnover the equation of asset turnover is sales divided by the capital employed okay guys so if you cancel these out then the equation would be pbit by capital employed isn't it so that's basically why it is said that the ROI is a product of profit margin as well as as a turnover. So keep that in mind. So that's basically all about the return on investment. And please understand the advantage. Okay, guys, advantages and disadvantages of each of these. Let's take a look at uh, residual income as well. What is resi residual income? Residual income is a measure of the center's profits after deducting a notional or imputed interest. So the equation would be profit before interest and tax minus imputed charge and what is imputed charge this is basically the investment or capital employed times the cost of capital isn't it as simple as that okay guys so imputed charge yeah so that's basically the equation for ri or residual income isn't it so what when you compare these two performance measures that is roi and ri what are the advantages and disadvantages which of these would be more comparable so that uh, we can use it to compare the performance of division? Well, that's definitely ROI, isn't it? Why? Because it's a percentage figure, isn't it? And we can compare the percentage figure. However, we cannot compare the absolute figure of two de uh, departments or divisions. Okay, guys, that's basically the concept here. So which, which one of these are good, uh, good for comparison? The return on investment. So keep that in mind and yeah that's basically it and also learn all the other advantages and disadvantages as well so keep that in mind now that's basically all about roi and ri and yet another factor is that in some questions you may be required to assess the performance of the division or the manager if you are assessing the performance of the manager then your roi calculation should have controllable profits isn't it 
because we have the principle of controllability, isn't it? We only hold the particular manager accountable for the cause that they have a certain degree of control over. So you have to exclude all the head office and other related costs and then calculate the profit and then calculate the ROI. Okay? So that's another important factor that you have to understand in your exam. Now, moving on to the last topic that is transfer pricing, which is one of the really important topics, isn't it? So keep that in mind. So let's understand the general rules behind transfer pricing here. What is transfer pricing? Well, this is basically internal sales, isn't it? When you conduct internal sales, what should be the price of the goods sold internally? That's basically what transfer pricing is all about, isn't it? And there are some general rules into calculating that. Let's take a look at that. The limit within which the transfer price should uh, fall are as follows. The minimum limit is the sum of the supplying divisions, marginal cost and the opportunity cost of the item transferred. And the maximum should be the lowest market price at which the receiving division could purchase the goods and services externally, less any internal cost savings in packaging and delivery. Okay, so let's take a look. So let's say that division A and division B are two divisions and division A is selling their products to division B internally. So what should be the transfer price or what should be the minimum price that A can charge? The minimum price that A can charge would be the marginal cost plus opportunity cost, isn't it? Opportunity cost. And what is the maximum price that division B can charge? Well, that would be the market price minus any internal cost savings such as there could be packaging costs saved or transportation costs saved, etc. Isn't it? So after deducting this particular cost, what would be the, the price? That is the price that could be uh, provided by division B. Okay, guys, that's the maximum limit. So within this limit, you can get the transfer price. So keep that in mind. Now, what else? You can also consider the factor behind opportunity cost as well. So what would be the opportunity cost here? Let's take a look. The maximum contribution foregone by the supplying division in transferring goods internally rather than selling them externally. So let's see that uh, why exactly do we have an opportunity cost here because let's say that division A has an external demand for the product that they're selling to division B. If they are operating in full capacity and if the particular demand is yet to be met, let's say that there is an external demand of uh, 1000 units and A has a capacity of uh, up to produce 800 units. So in this particular case, even if the if they sell all their products externally, they still have certain, uh, you know, unsatisfied demand, isn't it? So what, what's going to happen is now we have to take the particular opportunity cost. Why? Because if A sells their products to B rather than the external customer, then there will be some additional contribution foregone, isn't it? So that's basically what we are considering here. Okay, guys, so keep that in mind. That is the opportunity cost that is stated here. And what else? The contribution foregone by not using the same facilities in the producing division for their next best alternative use. Okay, guys, so either it could be that or if we use our particular materials for another product, then we would, would have gotten another contribution, okay guys. So that contribution for gone can also be stated as the opportunity cost as well. So keep that in mind. And some other general rule is that if there is no external market, then the transfer price is standard variable cost of production. However, if there is an external market, then the transfer price is the market price itself. Okay guys, so keep that in mind. So that's basically all the rules relating to transfer pricing just think logically and you'll get the answer to these transfer pricing questions okay guys so keep that in mind and that my dear friends concludes the entire revision of pm's important topics so we have covered all the relevant syllabus areas isn't it that the five syllabus areas has been covered now what we are about to do next is to practice questions okay guys so therefore we have to take a look at the question marathon okay guys so now we are moving towards the second pillar of the revision bootcamp that is the question marathon where we will practice questions so that you can develop the skill in order to apply the knowledge that you've learned through the entire syllabus area okay guys so i'll see you later in the question marathon this is vishnu vijay signing off